Okay, so Erica, welcome back to the U.S. European Media Hub. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you back here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, great. So could you tell us a little bit about what the Fulbright Commission does and what it is? Sure. So the Fulbright Commission in Brussels is a combination of things. We're running both the Fulbright Belgium program as well as the Fulbright Schumann EU program, which mm -hmm. I can talk a little bit more about, mm -hmm. as well as the Education Advising Center for Belgium. Mm -hmm. Great. And so what's the concept behind the Fulbright Commission? Like, when did it start? So uh, they all started at different times, but ours started in 1948 with then Senator Fulbright, who then basically passed a congressional law somewhere in the 60s to make sure that it would be a line item in Congress. Um, it began originally as a concept for mutual understanding that we would be able to kind of promote both education and cultural um, ambassadorialship between the United States and other countries. And that's kind of the origin. What has evolved in today is largely different types of scholarship programs, summer programs uh, for both students, scholars, both inbound, outbound, that means both Americans mm -hmm. and in this case Europeans. Mm -hmm. And so what exactly does it mean to receive a Fulbright grant from uh, to study in the U.S.? So receiving a Fulbright scholarship is certainly an honor. It's something that uh, you're receiving a monetary stipend, which is of course fantastic, mm -hmm. but it's also a responsibility. It's a responsibility and a commitment that you're basically going to be an ambassador of your home country to the United States or vice versa, an ambassador of the United States to Europe. And so what kinds of grants and programs are available? So we have a variety of programs. We have a student program for people who are d interested in doing a master's degree or higher, so master's, PhD, PhD research, a postdoc, um, also for scholars, so people who have their PhD and are perhaps going off to become professors or do a, um, a semester um, sabbatical to do research. We also have programs for teaching assistants, so English language teaching assistants for Americans who want to come uh, to Europe or, for instance, of um, Europeans who want to teach their uh, mother tongue in the United States, so in our case, um, largely French, Dutch, and German for the Belgian Commission. And you mentioned the Fulbright-Schumann program before. Could you please elaborate what is the difference between that and the Fulbright Commission? So unlike the other 150 Fulbright programs <laughs> throughout the world where we have the U.S. State Department money contributed against the um, home country money. So in my case, for instance, the, Belgian, the Kingdom of Belgium is giving money with the U.S. State Department money. So these two funds kind of fund the Fulbright um, Belgium program. We have a second program, this Fulbright-Schumann that you have mentioned, and that's together with the European Commission. So American State Department funds with the European Commission money. So these are the two programs. Unlike having one particular host country, we have 28 EU nation states that provide money to the Fulbright-Schumann program. The Fulbright-Schumann program is a specific topic. So in other words, it's not just that we're looking for people who are from those 28 EU member states studying in America or Americans going to the 28 EU member states. It's actually people who are working on an EU topic. And that can be kind of digested in different ways. For instance, it could be EU law, EU trade, um, EU diplomacy, uh, EU immigration, migration, things like that. Um, or it could be maybe even a broader topic. For instance, like if you're doing chemicals, the REACH Act within the EU um, is a great policy topic that might involve chemists. So it can be a variety of different topics. Wow, that sounds very interesting. And so who can apply to uh, the Fulbright? Uh, award through your office? So we can have a variety of different types of, uh, of awards and candidates who could be eligible. So for instance, one of the things I didn't mention was uh, a short uh, six-week program over the summer for um, high school students. So that therefore, high school students from Belgium are eligible to apply um, for a, an environmental stewardship uh, program. We also have a program for teachers. So that means teachers of English here in Belgium that would like to go to the United States for a six-week program to learn about American culture and teaching methods. Um, and then, of course, our traditional grants are largely Belgian or EU in this case, um, students and scholars who would like to be uh, in the United States for a master's degree and higher, and Americans who would like to come do the same in Europe. So those are the, the roughly large portfolios of people. We also have a special award um, with Harvard for a Frank Boas Award uh, for people who are interested in doing a graduate program um, uh, at Harvard. We also have a special scholarship for journalists. So there's really a very wide variety of programs that you can have at our uh, office. Sounds fantastic. So. What are some of the benefits of receiving a Fulbright uh, grant offer? 
So in addition to the title, of course, of the mm -hmm. Fulbright, which opens a lot of doors, um, and the financial contribution, which could be anywhere from a travel grant all the way up to $70,000. So it's a very wide array that you could be getting. Um, there's also some extra things. We provide J-1 visa sponsorship. Um, we provide sickness and accident insurance. Uh, we provide enrichment programs and orientations, a pre-departure orientation, um, a welcome back reception, uh, things like this. And so what are some of the qualities that you look for in an applicant? What really impresses you guys? So as I mentioned earlier, we're looking for those ambassadorial qualities. So we're looking for people who are certainly proficient in English, and especially if you're going to be conducting um, uh, research in America, then we want you to be you know, fight, sharpened on those skills. Conversely, we want Americans who are going to be doing any kind of research, um, whether they'd be reading books or interviewing folks to make sure that they have those refined um, language skills. But we're also looking for people who will be a multiplier. So in other words, someone who is basically coming on this grant and who will spread their knowledge to a lot of people. And so in other words, it's not just going over and writing a book where maybe 20 people will read your book, but it's in benefiting your own career, but it's actually for people who would be coming back to change a course curriculum. Wow, I went to the United States, I saw the way that they um, you know, offer courses or the way that they interact with students, so I'm going to come back and I'm going to teach you know, my 200 students in my A100 class about this particular topic. And can you please explain to us a little bit about the application timeline? Sure. So uh, indeed that the Fulbright Commissions around Europe and the world have different deadlines. On the American side, Americans applying to these Fulbright Commissions, they're roughly the same. So we're looking at the student application deadline to be somewhere in the middle of October. Um, that's with IIE, one of our um, uh, co-organizations that we work with. And then CIES controls a lot of the uh, applications between um, the United States and the rest of the world when it comes to scholar applications. Their deadline is traditionally August 1st. On the European slash Belgian side, those deadlines are roughly all in two different categories. Number one, um, the majority of application scholarships will come in on March 1st with a preliminary application deadline as February 1st. And this means that the Fulbright Schumann, the Fulbright uh, Belgium, both scholar and student awards, um, and the journalism grants all fall under this category. The second scholarship deadline, we try to keep it simple, um, is going to be December 1st, and that's for the summer institutes, as I mentioned, um, the foreign language teaching assistant, if you'd like to teach your home language in the United States, and thirdly, the Frank Boas Award. And there's an interview process, if I'm not mistaken. So concerning that, uh, how is it structured? So unlike some scholarships where perhaps the 30-page application is the most important, we use that as a base, and the Fulbright interview process for us is a really critical one because we're looking, as I mentioned, that not that you have this fantastic CV and a wonderful track record and a very nicely proposed essay and three lovely letters of recommendation that come along with it, but we're actually looking to see how do you communicate, how do you convey your message. If you're going to be on the Fulbright Schumann grant, how do you explain the European Union to an American who's never heard of it? If you're a Belgian, how do you explain the Flemish and the Walloon government to an American who's never heard of Belgium. These types of qualities are what we're looking for in the interview process, a very critical point. And do you have any examples of some common questions that can occur in the interview process? Sure. We'll generally ask people to find out why it is that they need to be in the United States. Why is it that you need to physically be in America? We'll also ask people why now? Why now in your career? Is it the right time? Perhaps you have two children, it's the only time you can get away. Perhaps you have a sabbatical and this is the right moment for you. Um, there are different reasons, but we love to hear about your motivation about why and when. Um, we're also looking to see the eligibility of your project. So in other words, perhaps you're enrolling in a master's program, but we'd like to know why this particular master's program, why this particular school, why this particular institution. Um, we'll also ask people to give us an explanation of what they think they will do when they return to their home country, as that's part of the J-1 visa rules, to return to your home country for a minimum of two years um, before you can work or live in America on a permanent basis. And so we will kind of ask people, what is it that you plan to do? Is it you know, writing chapters in a book? Is it giving presentations? presentations and workshops, is it conferences, um, redesigning uh, coursework, those types of you know, tangible outcomes that we can see. And so continuing on the interview process, what does an outstanding interview or interviewee look like? So I've seen this go in both directions. I've seen perhaps, you know, I'm sitting on a weekend reading hundreds and hundreds of application files and I'll have kind of my favorites of who I think is going to excel. And I'm always surprised when people come to the interview because sometimes people who I had never even looked at twice in their CV and application all of a sudden, you know, have stood out amongst the rest. They're really dynamic, they're sharp, they're excellent communicators and have conveyed very clearly to me the questions that I've just outlined for you. 
On the other hand, we've had some people who have fantastic CVs and cover letters and end up, um, you know, kind of underperforming. They weren't really good at communicating their own message. Perhaps they were brilliant scientists but couldn't convey what their specific method was um, to the layman that were there serving on the committee. So I've seen this go in both directions. And how long does the interview usually last? In our office, it generally takes between 10 and 15 minutes. We try not to go over that. So it's a very short amount of time. It's always conducted in English. Uh, for It doesn't matter which country you're applying from. And uh, we try to keep it as, uh, as brisk as possible. But it's really up to you, if I could give a tip, you, the applicant, to kind of turn around the, the interview. So it might be that there are 10 people on the interview committee. It could be that there's only two. But it's up to you. It's, it's not just us interviewing you. You're also trying to guide us as the interview committee. And from your professional experience, how can one prepare for the interview? I think that when you're applying for any kind of this uh, application process, a Fulbright or any other scholarship grant that's this intense, that it's really about being introspective and about figuring out for yourself, again, those questions I asked you earlier, what are your motivations, why now, and kind of thinking through them. Because if you don't know yourself, it's going to be really difficult for you to convince me and the other part, uh, selection committee members that, that you deserve a scholarship. And what's your favorite thing to see in an applicant to, uh, or what they do in an interview? And what's your least favorite? I love to see passion and I love to see enthusiasm. It's something that if I can be bought into your project that I might know nothing about um, neurobiology, I might no know nothing about gender studies, and if you can show me that passion and bring me along on that journey about what you're going to do and what you want to accomplish, then for me that's such a, a joy. Um, things I don't like to see, I, I, I love when people are humble, but sometimes it's painstakingly humble that people really undersell themselves. I know that uh, Europeans love to tease Americans that were exaggerated and egotistical, but in a case like this, I love that Americans kind of present themselves in a sharp way, um, always with their best foot forward. And I feel like sometimes the Europeans, um, you know, could buy into that a little bit and to try to present themselves in a stronger way. And in general, about how long should an applicant wait to discover the outcome of the interview? We, in bureaucratical terms, are like light speed. Uh, we are so fast, we try to do the interview process about two weeks after we receive the final application. That gives two weeks for our um, staff and our, our selection committee to be reading the files. And then generally, we will come to do an interview two weeks later, and then we will make the decision, generally speaking, that day, if not that week, and we will let you know within literally a week after the, uh, the interview. Are there any resources available at Brussels uh, for students interested in the Fulbright Commission or for in studying in the United States? Absolutely. This is a great question, as I mentioned in the very first part of our chat, about the Education USA office that's also located in our office. And this is a free resource for all students and scholars who are interested in applying to the United States who might have just general questions about what is a GPA, what is the GRE, um, and other types of questions like that. Or you could be asking for advice about um, the interview process, about um, CVs. Did you you know that Americans actually don't put pictures on their CV like many American uh, Europeans do. Um, general or very specific questions can always be asked um, at our resource center. We also have books in our library that you can always check out for free if you give us a deposit um, and a variety of other services. For instance, if you need to translate your own uh, grades, then we can kind of help you with that process and certify them for a small fee. And what are the best online resources for Fulbright Belgium and Fulbright uh, Schumann? So we have two websites, the Fulbright.be and the Fulbright FulbrightSchumann.eu websites, but we also have the Education USA Network, and the Education USA portfolio is a fantastic first resource uh, as a launching stone to get into any Fulbright program as well. And do you have any advice for applicants? Well, this might sound like a very callous uh, response, but it's always important to read the instructions. I'm sure anybody who's uh, running in any kind of um, a selection process knows that there's nothing more frustrating when we take the time to do events like the ones that we're doing right now, or we're out there uh, you know, doing webinars, doing um, interviews like this one, and people don't follow the instructions, or we've already said it before. Um, it's also important to show, uh, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, that enthusiasm. So, you know, contacting the office or, or coming to our events, participating on our online webinar chats. When we see you present and consistent like that, then we know that you're focused on this type of an award. I think that's a, a main tip. Um, you know, second is to ask questions. It might not be to our office, but it's always helpful to contact former Fulbright scholars, people who have come to Belgium or the, on the Fulbright Schumann project before. Um, there are a variety of methods of ways to contact people to find out more information. Do you have any final comments that you'd like to share with the audience? I think it's really important to be exploring both this opportunity to go to the United States through Fulbright, but also just generally speaking, Fulbright is not the only mechanism of going to the United States. And I would love to see more applications and more enthusiasm to get there.
Well, Erica, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for having me.